Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for everything that you've been sharing with us. And Lord, I pray in a very special way that you would be with us as we go through this uh, very uh, principal subject of healthful living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have been going over a lot of different things. We went through the, uh, the plan of redemption. We went through the last solemn service, and now we're going through a subject called healthful, healthful living. Now, brothers and sisters, uh, the subject of healthful living is one that deserves a lot of attention, a lot of attention, because we're told that uh, temperance is the foundation of all of the Christian graces, the foundation of all the Christian graces. Now, brothers and sisters, this is very integral for us to understand. Now, we see what this picture is, right? Now, this is a beautiful scene of a country setting. You know, um, I wish I lived in a place like this. I mean, to literally wake up to the mountains every morning. Do you know that um, this is what uh, Moses woke up to every day when he was getting trained for those 40 years in the wilderness? He was literally literally basking in the mountains of Midian. This is where he was living during those 40 years. And during those 40 years, laid, helped to really solidify the foundation of his, of his greatness as a leader of Israel. But this is a symbol of healthful living. And as we talked about before, during our morning message, this type of lifestyle constituted God's plan of life that he had set up in the beginning of time. Now, we're going to see what the purpose of healthful living is. Now, this is probably one of the top five quote, yeah, one of the top five quotes in all of the spirit of prophecy. This is taken from Manuscript Releases, page 228, paragraph one. It says, God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world, let's read these words highlighted in red together, is to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. We'll stop there. So the purpose why God gave us the three angels' messages was to prepare us to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. Now, we don't have time to get into it, but is this talking about the investigative judgment of the dead or the investigative judgment of the living? Of the living. Because when did the investigative judgment of the, living begin, of the dead begin? Sorry. 1844. And how long has that been in progress? It's been long continued in progress. And we're told in great controversy that soon, none know how soon that it is going to pass to the cases of the living. But do we know the particular event that is going to pass to the cases of the living? You know, brothers and sisters, I'll give you um, a little secret of Bible prophecy. Anything that is of prophetic significance taking place on earth is because something of prophetic significance is taking place in heaven. When we go back and read in the book of Genesis, when um, uh, Jesus and the angels went down to investigate Sodom and Gomorrah, what did Jesus say had happened with the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah? They cried all the way up until heaven. So because the sins reached up unto heaven, what came down upon Sodom and Gomorrah? Judgment and wrath. When the antediluvian was, world was destroyed by a flood, what had happened with their sins? They had reached unto what? When Babylon fell and Medo-Persia took over, what happened with the sins of Babylon? They reached unto what? Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 18. Let's go to Revelation chapter 18. And you know, this was constituted in the Lord's Prayer. What did Jesus pray? Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That was not just a prayer, but it was also a prophecy. Starting in verse 1, it says, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has come by the habitation of devils, 
and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Verse 5 says, For her sins have reached unto what? And God hath remembered her iniquities. And then it talks about all the doubling of, of wrath that is going to come upon this Babylonian system. So brothers and sisters, when there is something taking place of prophetic significance on earth, is because something has taken place in heaven. And so it says, this is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our what? I say this very sadly. Why did Review and Herald close down based upon this statement? Think, think. Why did Review and Herald close down based upon this statement? They weren't given the message. They, the message. they closed down because they stopped preparing a people to stand true to God during the investigative judgment. It says, our schools, now brothers and sisters, I went to one of our schools. I went to one of our schools uh, located in Jerusalem. And at this school, I promise you, we were not preparing a people to stand true to God during the investigative judgment. I can promise you we weren't doing that. It says, our sanitariums, hygienic, does anybody know what a hygienic restaurant is? Yes, yes, that's definitely part of it. And, um, you know, as the brother said, uh, there is a difference between a vegan restaurant and a hygienic restaurant. Do vegan restaurants know about the investigative judgment? For instance, does the, document, does the documentary Forks Over Knives or What the Health know about the investigative judgment? Do you know that uh, people like Samuel L. Jackson practice veganism? Now, is, 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 is that bad for him to practice veganism? But does he know anything about the investigative judgment? Certainly not when he's making movies like The Avengers. There's nothing but spiritualism. Brothers and sisters, it says treatment rooms and food factories. This is our what? So if we have schools, hygienic restaurants, so-called sanitariums, um, churches, and all these different things that are not preparing a people to stand true to God during the investigator's judgment, are we really fulfilling the purpose of the three angels' messages? Uh, can I wait to the Q&A, or do you need to? You can, you can wait. Oh, was it pressing? No. Okay, okay. It says, this is our purpose in carrying forward every line of work in the cause. Now, the reason why I brought this out with Helpful Living is for a very particular purpose. What is this a picture of? This is fruit. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Because you know, brothers and sisters, 2 Peter chapter 1 talks about present truth. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting verse 12, it says, oh, we're going to jump back, but we're going to start right here, and then we're going to work our way backwards in the text. 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 12, it says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the what? In the present truth. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, people are afraid to say present truth because they're afraid, like, as far as the connotation that's going to come upon them if they pronounce this. But is present truth a biblical terminology? Yeah, so we shouldn't be ashamed of it. Do you believe present truth? Do we believe present truth as Seventh-day Adventists? Seventh-day Adventism is present truth. So if Seventh-day Adventism is present truth, then by the grace of God, we are present truth believers. Amen? Amen. Verse 3, it says, according as his divine power, speaking of Jesus, Jesus is divine. He was not as brought forth or born of God. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, it's going to give us a, a uh, procedure that we ought to follow in order to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse 5, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith what? And to virtue, and to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, now notice temperance came before 
patience. So if we're not being temperate, can we be patient? The reason why there's so much contention and strife between husband and wife is because there's no what? There's no temperance. Why there's contention in the church is because there's no what? Do you know that we're told in the spirit of prophecy that one of the main reasons why there's contention in business meetings is because people have been overeating? Brothers and sisters, we need to wake up. We need to wake up. Jesus, brothers and sisters, Jesus really loves us. Jesus really, really loves us. He really, really loves us. He really wants us to be saved. And this is the, this is the only reason why he gives us all this. Even those, those things which, you know, brothers and sisters, sometimes Jesus would rebuke the disciples so much that it would even make them want to cry. <laughs> but his motivation in rebuking them was not to hurt them, it was to heal them. That is the work of the great physician. Because even though the physician cuts you, he doesn't cut you to kill you. He cuts you to do what? He'll cuts you, he cuts you to heal you. You know, there's a hymn that says, the great physician now is near, the sympathizing Jesus. It says, and add to patience godliness and, and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound and flourish, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In John 17, 3, what does the Bible say is life eternal? That we may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou was sent. So if we have these eight virtuous things in our character, what are we going to have? Jesus, and by having Jesus, what are we going to have? Eternal life. It says, verse 9, but he that lacketh these things is what? Now, what is the condition of Laodicea? They're blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged of his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if these things, for if these, for if ye do these things, ye shall never what? Now, when you go and study through the Bible, when the Bible is speaking of falling, it's speaking of what? It's speaking of sin. So the Bible is saying, if we do these things, we're not going to what? We're not going to sin. Brothers and sisters, it's literally that easy. It's literally, well, I won't say it's that simple. Salvation, God is trying to make very simple. What makes it hard is our natures. That's what makes it hard is our natures. And brothers and sisters, I want to get very, very practical. When, even when we're eating good things, when we have our health reform food, you know, because in principle, we're not vegans. We're really not. Because vegans uh, don't eat honey. The Bible says that we should eat honey. Vegans don't wear leather. Brothers and sisters, leather is very nice. So what we're saying, we're health reformers. We're not vegans, we're health reformers. But when we're eating our health reform food and we have our health reform carrot cake and all these different things and we have, you know, our soy ice cream from Trader Joe's and all of these, and all this good food and we're eating and the Holy Spirit says, you need to stop eating. But then your appetite says, eat a little bit more. Just one more bite. Just, just, just one more bite. And we go and we eat that food and we take one more bite. Um, and another one. D does our appetite feel satisfied? Yes, our appetite is satisfied. But what have we done in the process? We've not only grossly hurt our own bodies and our minds and our spirits, but we've hurt Jesus. And then Satan looks at all of this and says, they really believe that they're going to be ready for this crisis? And so let's continue. In verse 11 it says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So the Bible is saying, when we do these things, that this will be the entrance card into heaven. Amen. That's what the Bible is saying. Because it's not just confessing Jesus with your, mouth, with your mouth, there needs to be corresponding works. You know, I was looking at a telecast, and it was, two men were debating, and one uh, debater asked another debater, are you a Christian? Now, the, the man who was asked, are you a Christian, he lives the life of a worldling. And he doesn't, he has no, you know, um, quibbles about it. You know, he's a worldling. But the debater asked, are you a Christian? And the man said, you know, I, I've, you know, confessed the name of Jesus before. And so the debater said, oh, since you've confessed the name of Jesus, you're a Christian. Even though he's fornicating and doing all these things, simply because he confessed the name of Jesus, 
he's a Christian. Is that what the Bible says? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So let's notice what this says. Taken from Council on Diet and Foods, our habits of eating and drinking show whether we are of the world or among the number of whom the Lord by his mighty cleaver of truth has separated from the world. Does anybody know what the mighty cleaver of truth this is talking about? The first, second, and third angel's messages. So this is saying by how we eat, and how, you know it even goes down to how fast we eat. Do we thoroughly masticate the food in our mouths? You know, sometimes, you know, um, and it's not saying in criti criticizing judgment, that's not what I'm talking about, but sometimes I just sit down and I'm, you know, eating my food, and I see people get big plates of food, and they just wolf it down. And it's health reform food, but they are just wolfing it down. This is destroying the system, why? Because when you understand anatomy and physiology, the stomach does not have any teeth. So when the food is not thoroughly masticated, all of that gastric juice needs to be super pumped into the system, and that is just destroy, destroying the lining of the stomach, and then all these different health problems we get because we're not thoroughly masticating the food in our mouth. This is why we, sh we shouldn't chew gum. Because when we chew gum, it's deceiving our bodies into believing that food is about to go down the esophagus. And so gastric juice is released into the stomach, but there's a problem, there's no food. So what is that gastric juice doing? to the stomach. And then as a result, you get stomach ulcers, acid reflux. Brothers and sisters, the body is very delicate. Do you know that the antediluvians, their bodies were made so powerfully that they could literally violate natural law their whole life and never get sick? They never got sick. Their bodies had 20 times the vital force than we have now, 20 times. Adam could literally eat McDonald's every day of his life and he would never get sick. I'm not exaggerating. That's how powerfully God built the human race. But because we are no longer 15, 16, 17 feet tall, because we no longer have these powerful vital forces, can we, can, can we, now it's bad violating natural law just off of principle, but can we afford to violate natural law, especially considering our constitutions are not as strong like that anymore? We can't do it. We can't do it. Notice what this says. Let them teach the people to do what? Now, this is speaking of those who teach the people as we're doing now. Let them teach the people to preserve their health and increase the strength by avoiding the large amount of what? Cooking. Now, you know, I grew up in a, even though I, I am American, well, my father's Guyanese, I grew up in a Caribbean church. I grew up in a Caribbean church. Now, brothers and sisters, now, sadly, this is before I knew health reform. I used to eat jerk chicken. I used to eat ackee and saltfish and all of these different things. We, we, we used to chow down. <laughs> we, used to, we used to chow down. Now, one of the staples of a lot of the um, Caribbean brethren, um, I don't ever remember eating salad, ever. We, 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 it, everything was cooked. Everything was cooked. Every last thing was cooked, but it's saying that we need to avoid the large amount of cooking that has filled the world with chronic invalids. By precept and example, make it plain that the food which God gave Adam in his sinless state is the best for man's use as he seeks to regain that same sinless state. What type of food did Adam and Eve have in the beginning? Was it cooked or raw? In the Garden of Eden, it was raw. They were eating fruits and nuts and all of those good things. Now, brothers and sisters, you know, as I was in the um, cafeteria and um, um, I was, you know, thinking about um, just drinking a smoothie, you know, because especially when you're doing all this brain work, you know, um, you don't want to be putting a lot of food in the system. So I was just going to drink a smoothie and I'm um, just, you know, continue to prepare. But I, but the stomach was calling for I, I didn't eat this morning. I just drank a smoothie. And so my, I, w I was hungry. So I just got a little bit of food and um, I went on to eat it. Um, but. Besides the food that I got, the cooked food, I got some salad. Now, I was looking at people's place. I was like, hmm, I wonder who's going to get some salad. Um, and I wasn't seeing the salad be being eaten. That's a lie. You got some salad? You got two? Praise God. Praise God. The reason why I bring this out, brothers and sisters, the, um, 
the raw food is very, very good because the raw food has a lot of things like fiber, it has enzymes, all of these good things that are uh, nutrients, minerals, all of these things that are good and help to promote digestion and regularity in the bowel movements. It says, and notice this, the lack of stability in regard to the principles of health reform is a true index of their what? Their character and their spiritual strength. So when God says that we shouldn't um, be using things that have vinegar in it, like our Heinz tomato ketchup and our mustard and relish and all this, and um, we know we shouldn't do it because it destroys the lining of the stomach, but then we maybe go to a, even a health reform potluck that has some vinegar in it. And, you know, because we're afraid of ridicule, what do we do? We eat it. You know, um, we're told that we should not be eating things that have sodium bicarbonate in it. Does anybody know what sodium bicarbonate is? Now, besides baking soda, we're told that we should not use baking powder because baking powder has sodium bicarbonate in it. And so, you know, there's, there's alternatives. Now, so when we go and, you know, we, we do different things and we know that it has the baking soda and the baking powder in it, and uh, we know that we shouldn't eat it, but that, uh, that cake looks really, really good. Huh? <laughs> it's, it's vegan cake. It has, it has carob frosting on it. Car mm, carob frosting. Yes. Oh, no, no, it's fine. And we, we might get to some things more in the, in the Q&A. Now, when we eat food, that food eventually turns into what? Blood. Blood. Now, the sodium bicarbonate is, black, is bad because it adversely affects the, the blood. And, the, P, and all of those, the pH and all of those different things, helping to make the body acidic. Acidic. And, and does anybody know what type of environment cancer thrives in? An acidic or alkaline environment? Acidic. 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 You know, inspiration says that when foods have uh, the baking, so baking soda and the baking powder, that it should not even be placed on the table. This is another beautiful symbol of healthful living. Now, let's notice what the Ministry of Healing says. I know this is a familiar text, page 127. Pure air, sunlight, abstemoniousness. Does anybody know what abstemoniousness is? Temperance. Rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. It says it is essential both to understand the principles involved in the treatment of the sick and to have practical training that will enable one rightly to use his knowledge. This is why we're told in volume seven that we have now come to the time where every member of the church should take a hold of medical missionary work. Because was Jesus a medical missionary? He was the greatest mis medical missionary that ever existed. And this is uh, an adjacent text in Councils on Health. There are many ways of practicing the healing art, but there is only one way that heaven approves. God's remedies are the simple agencies of nature that will not tax or debilitate the system through their powerful properties. Pure air and water, cleanliness. Proper diet, purity of life. And a firm trust in God, going on, it says, fresh air, exercise. Exercise. You know, brothers and sisters, we don't exercise. You know, some of us haven't sweated in months. Literally, some of us have not sweated in months. You know, there's a term called uh, breaking a sweat. Some of us have not broke a sweat in a long time. We're breaking a whole lot of things, but we're not breaking sweats. Brothers and sisters, exercise is a law of health, and it doesn't matter how much good food you put in and water and all that. If you're not moving that constitution, what is going to happen? And do you know what, one of, the main, one of the reasons why a lot of times people say they don't want to get on health reform and all this, because people who practice it don't look healthy. Do you know the Bible says in the book of Daniel that when Daniel and the three Hebrew worthies were practicing health reform, it says that they were fat in flesh. The book Education in chapter 7, it says that in physical beauty, they looked better than the Babylonians. They were more attractive than the world. Physically, not just spiritually, but physically. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this is the ideal that we can reach when we follow God's plan of life. It says, because 
when the world sees that Christians have something better than what they have, do you think that they will want to stay in their worldliness or will they want to become a part of God's remnant people? They will want to become a part of the fold. And this is what is going to give power to the loud cry. It says, pure water and clean, sweet premises. Do you know um, it's possible to do all this, but if you have a dirty home, Brothers and sisters, we need to have clean homes. You know, I remember growing up as a young person, before I was converted, my, my room used to be filthy dirty. <laughs> How in the world can you have a filthy, dirty room and claim to be a Christian? Well, you're, we're, our parents have to tell us to clean our room. This should be a natural action of the young child, is to clean their room. And some of us are adults and our houses are filthy. Do you know that we're told that the kitchen should always be clean? Always be clean. Always sweet and clean. Always. But it says that these are within the reach of all with but little expense. You don't have to be a millionaire to have this. But drugs are, exp and <laughs> drugs are expensive, both in the outlay of means and the effect produced upon the system. Now, do you think that we can do this in our own strength? And I emphasize this for brothers and sisters, we literally can't drink enough water without Jesus. We can't exercise without Jesus. We can't do anything without his divine power. Now notice what medical ministry says. It is necessary to maintain a living connection with heaven, seeking as often as the daily, and I highlighted, super highlighted this, three times a what? Now, was this a principle that uh, Daniel uh, just made up? Where did he get it from? David. Let's turn to Psalm 55, verse 17. Psalm 55 and verse 17. He got it from David. Psalm and we're going to see this. Psalm 55, 17. It says, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud. I wish we could go over principles of prayer. We need to talk aloud when we pray. Not in our minds. Jesus never prayed in his mind. He now, even if you're in a place and you can't really speak out loud, you can still move the mouth. That's what Hannah did when she was in the temple. And so, 55, 17, and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Three times a day is the base minimum. Base minimum. The very, very base minimum. And we're told that young people who are thinking about getting married, when they're, when they're thinking about this, that they should double their prayers. So brothers and sisters, it says three times a day for divine grace to resist what? Appetite and passion. Because if you can't control your appetite, what do you think is going to happen to your passions? Do you think that David was violating on some points of appetite when he went into Bathsheba? Probably. Do you think that Solomon was violating some points of appetite when he was doing what he was doing? But do you know that, you know, we mentioned this on our prayer line yesterday, that Satan had so turned out Solomon that Solomon became a homosexual. That's what happened to Solomon. He became effeminate. Hmm? Uh, uh, I, maybe in the Q&A, I could actually show you from the Bible that he was a homosexual, not just a feminine. He was a flat-out, full-blown homosexual. Okay. Oh, we'll continue. It says, wrestling with appetite and passion, unaided by divine power, will be what? If you don't have the grace of God, you're going to be what? This is a divine promise. If you don't have Jesus, you're going to be unsuccessful. But if you have Jesus, what are you going to have? You're going to have success. We should never talk without faith. Don't even, don't, we shouldn't even pray, Lord, I don't, I don't think I'm going to, Lord, I'm, you said I'm going to make it. You said that I can overcome. I believe in your power to give me victory over this. But make Christ your stronghold and the language of your soul will be in all things, these things, we are more than what? Through him that loved us, said the Apostle Paul, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Brothers and sisters, this is the high ideal that God has for health reform. That in every area of life that we will be an example to the world. Amen? Do, do we want this personally for ourselves? 
Because God just doesn't want this for ourselves. He, wanted, he wants it for our spouses. He wants this for our children. He wants this for our churches. He wants this for our communities. He wants this for our nation, and he wants this for the entire world. Amen? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the blessings of what you have done um, through these wonderful messages. The Lord, speaking to all of our hearts, Father, I pray in a very special way that these things will not be a phase. Be with us as we transition to this phase of question and answer. I pray that you give me wisdom, dear Lord, because I am not Jesus, dear Lord. I don't have sufficient wisdom. So I pray in a very special way that you bring all things back to our, my remembrance in which you have shown me. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right. So just to clarify, so on Council of Isaac, Tuesday, 4, 6, and 7, 5, mm-hmm. when she said, let, our, let, our, um, let them learn how to, how to live helpfully, teaching to others what they have learned. Let them impart this knowledge as they would Bible instruction. Let them teach the people to preserve the health and increase the strength by avoiding the large amount of cooking that has filled the world with chronic singleness. And then she goes on to say that the diet that God gave to Adam in a single state is the best diet for us. Now, my mind, I don't think there's anything wrong with the raw diet. Mm-hmm. Now, are you saying that we should, you're promoting this no, no cooking period? <laughs> Just to clarify. You, you know, yeah, yeah, just like uh, what the, cook, uh, what the uh, sister said, because um, in everything, um, and that's a very, very good question, because I know a, a, a lot of times, and I'm pretty sure, uh, oh yes, yeah, because I know um, that's, that may be on the minds of uh, quite a number of people, but in looking at what the statement said, it said avoiding the large amount of cooking, the large amount of cooking. So um, I'll give you an example, like for instance, um, not even necessarily using myself as a criterion, but... Um, uh, generally, what I'll do um, when I have a, a, for lunch, for instance, I will have, I'll get a large plate of salad and then I'll get my cooked food after. And the cooked food, and because especially when you eat a lot of raw food, it's going to fill up the stomach, so you're not going to eat as much cooked food. And another thing is, you know, as uh, dear brother Don brought out, we eat too much food. We eat way too much food. And uh, the raw food would really, really help with that. But uh, the principle that is bringing out is avoiding the large amount of cooking. Yes. Um, I don't know if this is valid, mm-hmm. but what I was told is that if you cook your food um, 120 degrees in the kitchen to the floor, is that too much? Now, I, I possibly have heard that, but I don't, I don't really recall that. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have an, I don't have an answer. Have you? Have... Thank you, thank you. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. We'll hear your prayers. Yes. Mm -hmm. He heard his voice. Now, uh, uh, in 5517, it says that he would cry a what? A loud. Aloud. So aloud means what? Audibly out loud. Now, we'll give another example. Let's go to uh, Psalm. Let's go to Psalm. There's, there's so many texts. There's so many texts. Let's go to uh, Psalm. Psalm 55, in verse 1. It says... Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my what? So, so, so he's saying, God, please hear my prayer. Verse 2, it says, attend unto me and hear me. Now, just talking about simple interaction, if I were to come to this sister and we're talking, um, would she be able to hear me if I was talking to her in my mind? That's not simple. This is... 
is, God, is nothing. God is God. God can heal whatever you have in your heart, your brain. God can heal it. Now, based upon the point and the, and the uh, point we're seeking to emphasize, now notice the, the example that, that I just gave. If, I talk to the, if I'm seeking to talk to her, but yet I'm saying everything I want to say to her in my mind, can she hear it? No, 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 no. Yes or no? Okay, yes for her. No, no, she can't hear it. She can't hear it. So, brothers and sisters, we understand that God can, can do anything. He just can't lie. But he can do anything. But the principle is, and this is one of the things that God really seeks to emphasize. One of the things that God wants to do, he wants the relationship to be very real, especially for us. Especially for us. I ask you a question. Um, when you really, really love somebody, um, even though that they can think that they love you uh, in their mind and, you know, they show all you this affection, doesn't it make a difference when they actually say, I love you? Uh, more than just thinking it. Can you think you love your spouse? Yes, 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 yes you can. But they won't know. But when you make it audible, does it make a difference for them? Now, does it make a difference for you as well? Do you know that one of the principles of psychology when you study ministry of healing is that what we say actually reacts upon ourselves? We're told that thoughts and feelings are strengthened and encouraged as we give them utterance. So one of the reasons why we should pray out loud is because the effect that it has upon ourselves. Because we're told in Steps to Christ that prayer does not bring God down to us, but it brings us up to him. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, it makes a very big difference when you actually verbally and audibly talk to God. It makes the relationship very, very real. Just to comment on that. Yes, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yes, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Just to comment on that, um, there was a point in time when I would not pray out loud because I was afraid that the devil would get my prayers. Yes. We do understand, yeah, we do understand those exceptions. Exactly. So, but, but we're, we're yeah, yeah, so go ahead, go ahead. It deepens, when I began to pray a lot of my walk, it deepens my walk with God because it, as Christians, believe it or not, even though we say we believe in God, a lot of times our actions, we don't really believe in God. But when we actually talk to him audibly, mm -hmm. it makes his presence a, a reality. Yes. Because we're acknowledging that we're actually speaking to to an individual, yes, yes. So it does help. And also your prayer, if you have something that you want to share with God, no matter how much Satan tries, he cannot interfere with God in that prayer. Amen. Now I'll ask you a question because we have to get our brother Don in the back. Um, yes, yes. Because brothers and sisters, um, what uh, example did Jesus generally follow? Um, as the brother was mentioning, you know, sending our prayers to the Lord in our hearts, and that's very, very needed in a lot of situations. But did Jesus pray mostly out loud or in his mind? He prayed out loud. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was wrestling with satanic forces, did he mind that Satan was listening to him? Brothers and sisters, you actually want Satan to hear your prayers. You know, one time I remember I was praying. I said, I said, Lord, I hope Satan is listening to this. You want him to hear your prayers. He's a, he, he's a clown. He's a defeated foe. Amen. We should not be afraid of that imposter. Amen. Oh, pardon me. Uh, just, yes, yes, yes. Br Brother Donna. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on where Sister Bobby uh, touched on showing you where that uh, represents wrong. Actually, in, in technically, it's one big thing or less is considered not. They, they cook it too long, yes, yes.
us. And that's what it really is. The Lord help us, really. Yes, yes. 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 Who can't eat raw food. Now, do you mean like a person can't eat fruits, they can't eat vegetables, they can't eat nuts, they can't mm -hmm. eat... Um, those are... I haven't personally come across that. Um, what I would encourage you to do is do some research on that. Yeah, I would, I would encourage you because um, that would definitely have to be a case of sickness because that's not natural. So that actually really a case of extreme sickness. Um, Exactly. You know, one of the reasons why we're so allergic to so many things is because of what they've done in genetically modifying the foods. That's another reason why we need to grow our own foods. You know, I remember one story I was hearing where a, a woman who was actually sick of cancer, she went to an organic farm and I, I believe spent maybe about three or four months there, maybe longer, and she was just eating organic food every day. Guess what happened? The cancer went away. So, brothers and sisters, food, you know, um, there was a statement by the man by the name of uh, uh, Hippocrates, and he said, uh, let thy food be thy medicine, and thy medicine be thy food. Yes, yes. Did you the, the verse, the the oh, verse two. Yes, 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 thank you very much. It says, um, I mourn in my complaint and make a what? I make a noise. You know, sometimes we're wrestling with God so much that we don't even really say anything. We just make a noise. You know, the Bible talks about groanings and all of those things and the Holy Spirit interpreting it to heaven. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It is, it is very, very sweet. Very, very sweet. And so, um, yeah. Do you have a question? Oh, did you say something, brother? Yes. Um, how do you have as vision to food factories? Because in my mind, I'm thinking of, you know, the fast machines, the yeah. meals. I mean, I know it's, it wouldn't be that way, but then again, if a lot of ethnics are, you know, requesting granola, for example, they will need a fast method of making the food. So how would you even make a good food factory? A good food factory. Do you even have now, we have things like a Loma Linda products, and now I'm not an advocate of Loma Linda products, not the means to bash them, but um, I'm not an advocate of it. But um, uh, as far as uh, food and making food and things like that, does anybody know what is the principal um, important component of good food besides glorifying God? It starts with an N. Nutrition. Nutrition. So when we're making food, we need to be primarily concerned with what? Now, if it's truly nutritious, it's going to taste good. Now, there are, now don't get me wrong. There are some things that are nutritious that don't taste good. Um, you know, I, I do understand that. But um, we're told that knowing how to cook is worth 10 talents. You know, I was reading a statement in a little book called Healthful Living. It says that there is religion in good cooking. And she went on to say, I doubt the religion of that class who are too ignorant and careless to learn to cook. So to claim to be a health reformer and don't know how to cook, your, your, your Christianity is even questionable. <laughs> but uh, as far as answering your question, um, you know, our minds don't really have to think of things like in a very complex state. Um, and just even speaking very, very simply, your own kitchen can be a food factory. It doesn't have to be things on a conveyor belt. Now, I'm starting from a, a simple method, and then, then I'll build up. Like, for instance, um, at one time, I was operating a food factory. I was selling granola. And um, in my food factory, um, you know, and the granola tasted very, very good. I'm not just saying that. It, it, did, it, did it taste good? <laughs> it tasted good. It tasted good. But the food factory, now, we had to, um, uh, uh, we had to dismember it for a little bit because we had to go over some uh, business uh, practices. But um, your kitchen can be a food factory. Your kitchen can be a food factory. But as far as, you know, getting it to the place where you can make a lot of food, you know, uh, rapidly, um, when it comes to things like that, it's, I would say one of the things is making sure that there's not a lot of ingredients in the food. But, but how do you do it? Though? How do you do it? Like, how do you have a food factory? I'm just, 
I know we can, obviously, because it says it. But yeah. How? Like, you, like, how do you have it in your kitchen, considering the fact that your food can spoil fast? Yes. If you live in Washington State, and you're sending it to me, and I live in Georgia. How is that, you know, like, am I making sense? Like, I know we've had, like, when I went to Kansas City, we had, you know, granola chips were the more we were very delicious. Like, yes. I hate that. Um, <laughs> A food factory and it'd be good. Um, yes, Brother Don, you had a you had a comment? Oh, you want? Okay. Oh no. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. She got her. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, brother. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you to talk to that brother. All right. Uh, can I talk now? Oh, go, yeah, go ahead. Uh, let me read something about silent prayer. Mm -hmm. In um, Prophet and King, mm -hmm. chapter 13, and I think it's the title of the tabernacle or okay, something that I cannot see. Well, right. tabernacle and services? No, no services. Uh, something like that, because my phone said it's off right now. Yeah. Uh, okay, go ahead. Okay. It says, ask the priest morning and evening, and set before him the gifts of the time of incense, the daily sacrifice was ready to be offered upon the altar in the court to the altar. This was the time of incense entrance to the worshipers who assembled at the tabernacle. Before entering into the presence of God through the ministration of the priest, they were to engage in earnest searching of heart and confession of sin. They united in silent prayer with their faces toward the holy place. Thus, the predictions ascended with the, the, the cloud of incense, while faith laid hold upon the merit of the honor Savior prepared by the atoning sacrifice. The hours appointed for the morning and the evening sacrifice were regarded as sacred, and they came to be observed as a set time for worship throughout the Jewish nation. I don't want to read more, but silent prayer was key in that um, occasion. And it has been key mm -hmm. in Jesus' um, ministry when he was on earth. If you go to, I don't have it right now, but a lot of places in Isaiah of Egypt, Isaiah of Egypt, you will see that Jesus was praying silently. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to have a good 
communion with God. I, I believe it. And this is the Bible also. Mm. This is your prophecy. If you want to have a personal good communion with God, you're going to have good silence. Mm. Now, the only other thing I don't have it right here, but I can get it. Mm. A feminine is uh, a derived word from feminine. Mm -hmm. It's not from any other word, feminine. Mm. Solomon got so many wives mm -hmm. and mistresses in his life that he was kind of like acting like ladies, not like men wanting a, a, a another man, like in, if you say um, what, um, homosexual. He yep. was not homosexual. He mm -hmm. was acting because he, he got so many females in his mm -hmm. life. And at, at the end of the day, he got to where he was not. Um, and a lot of people are saying the same thing, and every time they see that, that, that bothers me. Not, not. I understand what you're saying. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. They misinterpret the Bible. Oh, oh, it's it's not a misinterpretation. Um, wh what I'll do, um, I'll I will show um, where the Bible actually uh, says that, and um, just just to you know answer your question. That's all, and um, and um, yes, yes. But uh, the thing with Time? Okay. Yeah, the thing with it is that um, silent prayer is very important. And uh, one of the things that we always want to remember is that we don't want to take the exception and make it the rule. Because the exception is that on certain times the silent prayer was, you know, necessary for certain occasions, you know, uh, circumstances and things. But the rule principally was praying out loud. For instance, this was the example followed by Daniel. This is the example followed by David. This is the example followed by Jesus. And it was so much so that when Jesus was praying out loud to the Father, when the disciples came over to Jesus and they heard him praying out loud, they were so impacted by the, by the serious depth of his prayer that they said, Lord, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples. Like we know how to pray, but we've never heard somebody pray like that before. And so the principle is, is that uh, we do understand that there are exceptions, but we don't want to make it the rule. Like, for instance, you know, um, a lot of times in our church today, when people understand principles of the truth, um, they'll take exceptions as to justify uh, starting independent churches and all these different things. But that's an exception that they try to use to make it the rule. And that is not the rule. That is not the rule. Um, and also, uh, let's turn to uh, 1 Kings Let's turn to uh, 1 Kings. Let's turn to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. And it's very, very... Oh, brother, pardon me. Oh, what is your name? Elias. Elias? Yes, yes, brother Elias. He made a very, very good point. Solomon had a lot of wives, and he indulged his lower nature so much that um, it was bad. Very, very bad. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 3 says, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. Now, there are some people who would relish in this. <laughs> relish in this. But polygamy is one of the sins that brought the destruction of God upon the antediluvians. Verse 4 says, And it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Verse 5, And Solomon went after Ashtoreth. Does anybody know who Ashtoreth is? She was the fertility goddess. Now, the modern form of Ashtoreth is Wonder Woman. Did anybody know that? You know, because every pagan civilization has had their version of the female goddess. In Egypt, her name was Isis. In Greco-Roman culture, her name was Diana, which is Wonder Woman. But here, her name was Astoreth. This is the history of paganism. Verse 5, it says, For Solomon went after Astoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians. And after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Now, Milcom, another name for him was Molech. Molech. Now, you, 
I, I can't, there's actually a slide that I have on this, but it's going to take too much time to bring it up. But it says, for Solomon went after Astoreth. Now, when they uh, uh, worshipped the goddess Astoreth, because she was the fertility goddess, they worshipped her by practicing fornication and adultery. Her worship was literally consecrated by vice. They would go into the pagan temples and engage in fornication, adultery, and they didn't stop there. They practiced bestiality and homosexuality. This is what they practiced And the Bible says that Solomon went after Astoreth. So in worshiping Astoreth, what was Solomon practicing? Bestiality and homosexuality. Brothers and sisters, I know it hurts to think, but when you turn your heart away from God, this is what he will do to you. That is the power of his love. But one of the things I do want to emphasize, though Solomon did turn, what was the influence of his example? As a result of his example, the nation of Israel was divided into how many divisions? Two divisions. Israel never really ever recovered from the influence of Solomon. It never really did. And the influence of Solomon so progressed to the point that Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. That was the influence do you know, brothers and sisters, when you, stu- when you study these things, Solomon contributed very, very heavily to occult knowledge. A lot of what Freemasons practice came as a result of what Solomon did. It's amazing. In Freemasonry, they talk a lot about Solomon's temple. Satan heavily used King Solomon. He heavily used him. But as dear brother said, he did repent. And we thank God that he is going to be in the kingdom and we're going to see him. Amen. But it is a warning that we should not follow his practices. Amen. 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 A question? Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, oh, pardon me, um, can he get a mic or is... Yes. Yes, yes. And do you know that Astoreth worship and Molech worship is embodied in America today? Do you know, brothers and sisters, that all of the fornication that uh, society uh, pushes upon our youth and adults, it's actually Astoreth worship. And do, brothers and sisters, do you know that abortion is nothing more than Molech worship? 
Do you know that ever since Roe v. vs. Raid, that over 50 million babies have been killed? Since Roe v. vs. Raid. The only thing it is is modern Ashtoreth and Molech worship. That's the only thing it is. Uh, they, I'm sorry. You, yes. Okay, okay. Okay, this is the last one. Yes. It is, it's in a Ministry of Healing, chapter 18, called Mind Cure. Yes, called Mind Cure, called Mind Cure. Now, I believe that we're going to have some time after, but out, outside, yes, yes, we do have some material that's going to be available for purchase that's going to talk about a lot of these different things that we've been talking about today. So if you do have the means, we highly encourage you to get it, highly, highly encourage but um, I believe that is, I believe that is also, let's close with a, a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the blessings of the plan of redemption. Dear Lord, you want to enlighten our understanding, our minds. Dear Lord, you want us to be equipped so that we can help each other and help the world to be prepared for Christ's soon coming. I pray that the truths today, the Lord, will have left an indelible impression upon our minds. In Jesus' name, amen.